back. Um, since I, I knew we were going to run into this problem, so here's what I think we're going to do. So today we're supposed to do a business meeting today. I knew a lot of people were going to be away. Um, so I think what I'm going to do is on Monday, so if you check your inbox on Monday, I'm just going to do like, you know, business meeting like announcement type stuff. Just the latest things, where we're at, what we're thinking about, like what's coming up. And, uh, and then from there, like if you want to email that and say, hey, what about this? That doesn't make sense. What about that over there? Um, and if more things come up, then we'll just do it maybe like a following week, like with more people here. Then we don't have to have the same conversation like sometimes. That's not good? Right? So I'll just do a video of the latest stuff as far as what we're doing, what we're doing after. So I'll get that to you tomorrow in your inbox. I'm not sure what time, but at some point I will. Prayer meeting on Wednesday. Happy 4th of July. Yeah. Um, let's see here. Uh, third Rocky Hill Bible study on Friday night, 6 p.m. You can see on Thursday, right? Get the other small group. So again, they're happening. If you get any time freed up on any of those two nights, uh, thank you to Tab and Mark. I know that they're away, but a, uh, I don't know if they had a chance to make it there, but you know, they hang out there. I saw a video of you know what? I, my very first thought when I saw that video was like, you know, it was short too. You know? like, I saw the video and I'm like, and I saw people just being themselves. And like, yeah. My first thought was, everything is right. No. <laughs> everything is right. <laughs> Uh, oh, and so on, I guess on the 26th, where's that church hang on the 26th? I think that's my fault. Oh, it's your fault? It's not supposed to be there. Everybody say, Kayla, that's your fault. <laughs> 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 it's not mine. Uh, Men's Fellowship, we had a great time digging into the Word. Um, yesterday, that was really good. We'll be doing that again at the end of the month. And so, you can see the ACW Bible study hangouts coming up. Sunday, fun day on the 14th. So if you have not yet, it's going to be a good idea to block off that Sunday uh, on the 14th. All right, that's always a really fun time. Yeah, we're working out today. <laughs> Bodybuilding. So let me turn there too. Okay, Acts 6. Let's check it out. So Heavenly Father, speak to our hearts as we dig into your word, Lord. I pray that you would give us understanding that leads to transformation. Father, we desire understanding that leads to transformation. Speak to our hearts, touch our hearts. Help us to know you better, Lord. Pray against all the distractions in our minds and maybe in our hearts, confusions, anxieties. Pray that you just settle them, Father, so we can clearly receive your word. Then we just pray against the enemy that is looking to steal anything from your word going out. Holy Spirit, protect and cultivate this place. In Jesus' name, amen. So Acts chapter 6. If you remember, uh, last time we were together looking at the book of Acts, it was fun last weekend, wasn't it? Doing dedication for little John Vito. That was fun. Got to meet, my, to meet a lot of the Maimon and Sinopoli family, which was a lot of fun. Um, so we... I thought it took an awesome spirit-led detour, just talking about dedications and um, you know personal experiences. And the week before that, you know, we finished up in Acts five. And what we talked about was that you know there was heavy-duty persecution just starting to come into the church. And we talked about a lot of different things, um, but one of the things that we found was that. Persecution actually draws the real believers closer together and it actually creates more, ment more momentum for what God is doing. Even though the entire intent and design on persecution is to actually make you want to stop, to make you quit. So basically if I torture you and treat you harshly enough, then hopefully eventually you will stop doing what you're doing. And in the kingdom, it actually has the opposite effect because it's the upside down kingdom. And so that's where we left off. In Acts 6, we pick up in a really interesting place, really interesting scenario. 
And I called it bodybuilding, not necessarily because, you know, we're talking about working out and lifting weights, but more so every time you talk about church, you talk about the bride of Christ, the Bible always refers to that as a body. As a body. And so different churches in different places, right, were just different parts of the body. Sometimes you're the big toe, sometimes you're the little one, sometimes you're the armpit. You know, it's just, it's just you're different parts at different season. But it's crazy to have just a hand and just brag about how you're a hand and you're the most important thing that has ever existed. And I'll tell you what, the hand is useless without the brain. And if you've got just a brain by itself, you can't really function or do anything. You got no leg. I mean, you get what I'm saying. And so the idea is, it's a beautiful, awesome, and amazing thing when the body of Christ thinks and functions like the body of Christ. One thing, let me suggest to you one thing, a couple of things I can get in the way. Right? Jealousy is a killer. Gossiping is a killer. You know, it's also a silent killer. Inappropriately placed pride in a local congregation. Inappropriately placed pride. I am proud to be a CC Nogi member. I have lots of t-shirts at home. <laughs> I was just talking with Rob a little while ago. There are multiple times, you know, we had a small group on Thursday night, and just any time we get together, God's honest truth. I would say 98% of the time, my heart and my soul is so encouraged just by being around you guys, by hearing what you talk about, uh, by hearing like just what the Lord is doing in your life, by hearing about recent struggles, by hearing about risks that you're taking, steps of faith. I'm really those are the other two percent of the times. Yeah, I don't know. But I'll just say, 98% of the time, that's honestly how I feel. And so I'm very proud about what God is building and doing here in our midst. I'm very encouraged by that. I'm very proud about that. I'm very happy and proud that people can sing, I'm a child of God, and be excited about that. And just raise their hands, or fall on their knees, or have tears come, because it's actually a true thing. I'm excited. I'm proud about that. They're more important about that than they are, did I sing that note right? Did I get this part here? Like... You're just happy just to sing it and just to declare the truth and just assault the darkness with that. I'm happy about that. It could get out of whack. I could inappropriately place that pride and I'm like, well, if you want to know how to do church, come check out CC Noggin and see how we do it. <laughs> Bring your notepad and we'll give you all lessons. And I don't think any church leadership would ever say it that way. But sometimes it could come off like that. And I'm not saying we should go around judging everybody either, because that's not helping anything either. But it's really healthy to be proud of where we gather, the family that we're in. That's why it's a big deal to move from a tender you know, to member, because it's like you really start to solidify yourself as really, you're saying, yeah, I'm part of the bride. Like, I want to be. I want to be solidified there. And so when you see it that way, it's like, it's awesome. We're just here in Naugatuck. We're a little expression of God's spirit that's happening all over the globe. And I'm proud of it. But not so much so that, you know, we just, we're going to forget about our brothers and sisters that are being persecuted and then are having a difficult time across the globe. And so, the enemy has been, unfortunately, very successful in splitting a lot of the body up. And it's crazy how successful he's been using things like personal offenses. That's, just, that's a huge one. Huge one, huge one, huge one. Just being personally offended by people. What's really interesting to me is that as you go through and you read you know, the working of the Holy Spirit and the development of you know, what God has been doing in the church, you don't read anywhere that it was sort of okay to have issues and personal offenses with people and somehow that was justified. You don't find any Bible passage like anywhere saying any of that. But just that alone has divided so many like church families and church bodies. So you can do it with personal offense. You could do it with types of music that's played. You could do it with, you know, if people's uh, personal preferences are not satisfied to where it's like very consumeristic. 
Uh, you could do it for, and then there's some legitimate reasons where people have been taken advantage of, where power has been inappropriately used, uh, where people have been reckless, you know, there's been failures morally, financially, ethically, all that kind of stuff. That's legitimate. But unfortunately, the enemy has been too successful with non-issue things that we make be big issues. Because we think that the church belongs for us. And that's partially true. But the reality is, we're part of a much bigger picture. Much bigger picture. And in this section, this chapter, I believe, I feel like, if Luke was here right now because he wrote Acts, I feel like if we were to say, hey Luke, is this what you meant? I feel like, yeah. For the most part, Jared, I think that's what I was going after. And that's like kind of what we want to get to. So let me read and, and, and show you a couple things. So it says, in those days, again, Acts 6, verse 1, in those days... When the number of disciples was increasing, the Grecian Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So get what's going on here. Increasing. That's a good term when you're talking about church. That's what you want to have happen. They weren't formal in any way yet. So it's not like necessarily they're gathering like we do on a Sunday morning. It wasn't super formal like that. It was just they loved Jesus. They knew what had to be done. And they just wanted to gather together and get it done. And people were increasing. Meaning that people were becoming believers in Jesus Christ. They were believing the message. And they were starting to receive the message and adopt it into their lives. And it said, we just read, there is an issue, right? Everybody say issue. issue. There's always issues. Always. There are issues in this church. And there's new ones all the time. And there's still some old ones we've got to take care of. There's always issues. Wherever you go, there's always, always issues. This is literally the first environment. And you want to know who the leaders are of this church? The 12 apostles. And what was the issue in the church? The issue in the church was discrimination. So you tie that to now. So it'd be like if... We're helping out at the food bank, and we go help out down there and do a bunch of things. But, you know, we're showing favoritism to a select group, you know, in town. And they get kind of the good stuff. But then there's another group of people based on, you can base on anything, right? Skin type, background, whatever. But if there's preferential treatment going on, obviously that's a problem. So the preferential discriminatory treatment that was happening was that there was a group of Jews that were Greek-speaking. The way had history had worked out and just the way they were dispersed, there is a significant amount of Jewish people um, that didn't speak Hebrew because they didn't grow up in that part of the world near Jerusalem. They grew up further away. So they're Hebrew by nature, but their language and their customs is very Greek. Then you have the real Jews that are from Jerusalem. They speak the language. They're from the area. They look Jewish. And so, the way the food is being given out to, you can just see it developing. If you imagine it in your mind, you could see it being like, oh yeah, that family is like the real ones. Let them, you know, the extra stuff. Them, yeah, I don't know. Plus they give me attitude, I don't know. But get them, you know, the stuff. You could easily see how that plays out. So you got discriminatory behavior happening in the church. Verse 2. So they decided it was a bad church and started a new one. <laughs> right? That's like, that's what we do. Oh, this place is horrible. That's not of God. The spirit is not there. Look at these hypocrites that go here. Thankfully, it doesn't say that. Somehow we thought that, that was a good thing to do, and so a lot of times we do that. Verse 2. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said... It would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the Word of God in order to wait on tables. A couple of interesting things. In verse 1, see where it says daily distribution? Is that a yes or a no? Okay. Daily distribution. Diakonia. That's the Greek word. You don't have to write it down. In verse 2, it says, see where it says wait on tables? Wait on diakonin. So this is really the first time that deacon ministry is happening, is taking place. 
The first time in the Bible. Because a lot of times like, what does a deacon, what does a deacon do? Well, it's a good question. And a lot of times you can figure out what the role of a particular office of a church person is by looking at the first time, its first appearance. And this is it right here. They needed people to help distribute food and not just weigh it on tables, but take care of people that needed things. It's a deacon ministry. So here's what the 12 said. Verse 3 said, Brothers, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the Spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer in the ministry of the Word. So let's picture this now. So let's say, right, we get an issue at church. This is what this is like. So let's say, so like a van is something we're going to purchase in the near future, right? That would be part of like when I send out the video as far as where we're at, what we're thinking about and entertaining. Imagine any church setting, not just here, just any church setting, got a big decision to be made, something's got to be taken care of. And the leadership says, yeah, we have to focus on this. Everybody in the congregation, just go figure it out. That's literally what he just did here. That's what they said. They didn't appoint these deacons. They said, listen, we know that if we get caught up doing that role, and now they're not saying that's inferior. They're just saying it's not part of their main calling nor their priority from where they're gifted. But they do know that other people are, and it's significant that now they start to do it. So... They're saying, hey, we're not going to figure it out for you. We're not going to do it for you. The disciples just pick seven. Can you imagine? I feel like if you had a church of like 200 people or whatever, 100 people, whatever, have like 10 people, I mean, that's going to be a problem. Who gets picked and who doesn't get picked? And why did they get picked? And who did the picking? And how well did they know them? And what qualifies them to be picked? And it's going to be a whole thing. That's the way they chose. Well, shouldn't the leadership do that? Like, what kind of leadership is that? You know, maybe that's why they're in this problem to begin with. What? <sighs> you know. But they did a good thing. Watch. It says, this proposal pleased the whole group. They chose, here's who they chose. Stephen, we're going to learn more about next week, not this week. He was full of faith in the Holy Spirit. Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, Nicholas, and that was all of them. Verse 6, they presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. So the word of God spread, the number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. So they picked these seven, and if you were to spend the time to look up sort of the history of those seven, you're not going to find a whole lot, actually. A couple of church traditions are attached to a couple of those names, but you won't find a whole lot. But they picked these seven, and the one requirement was that they would be filled with the Spirit and filled with wisdom. That was the requirement. How are the disciples picking that? They don't give us details. We don't know about that. So then after they picked the seven... They bring them out to the front or in the group or wherever the location was, but they lay hands on them and they pray for them. And say, hey, everybody, we're recognizing this new deacon serving. That's what diakonin, diakonos means, this serving ministry. It's not some small thing, right? They chose people that were full of the Spirit and full of wisdom. Not just people that were able and capable, but they had to have a certain level of spiritual maturity. So it's not just like, oh yeah, if I can clean stuff and put stuff away and hand out food, I could be a deacon. No. It's not supposed to be like that. It's not supposed to be like that. You saw the requirement there. That's actually pretty heavy duty. And then we read that they just increased more and more. And then it says that a, a bunch of priests, Jewish priests, actually turned from their religious ways and gave their lives over to Jesus Christ. So it's pretty interesting what happens. So... I call it bodybuilding because the body was starting to be built. Up until this time, you just had like the 12 apostles who were doing what they were doing and God was using them, but it wasn't sufficient. God had bigger plans. So here's what I want to do. 
And I'm going to try and do this actually too for the next like at least few months because I feel like the Spirit said, hey, you got to do this. So I said, okay, I'll do that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you the, 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 the plain meaning. And what that means is I want to just give you just the plain meaning of what happens here. You don't have to be a Christian to like pick up the plain meaning. Plain meaning means like look at the, what's the subject, what's the grammar, what's the plot, what's going on, who are the people involved. Because I feel like sometimes, and I'm guilty of this as well, sometimes we just get into a passage, just sort of give you what's on your heart, and you could even just miss the plain meaning of Scripture. And I feel like that's a total disservice to people. So what I want to do, at least for the next few months, is be really clear because, you know, when you're studying your Bibles too, like, isn't that the main idea? You're not just looking to say, hey, what is this saying to me right now? Eventually you want to get there. But eventually you want to get to, like, first where you want to start is, what does it even say? Because otherwise I'm going to try and make it say something that Luke was never trying to say. And I don't think that we want to do that. So I'm going to give you the plain meaning first, and then I'm going to give you what I think the spirit-led meaning is, like what's for us like right now today. Does that make sense? So the plain meaning is this. The needs slash problems of the church exceeded the call of the apostles. So the apostles wisely instructed the disciples on how to be an active and fruitful part of a spirit-led prioritization which led to a supernatural increase of believers. So if you read Acts 6, 1 through 7, and you don't get something like that in here as basic understanding, you basically should stop and continue to read and have yourself in, dive in there until you actually can grasp just what's even going on. Because there's some key things going on there. There was needs and problems in this church. There's going to be needs and problems in every church. Every church. It's not a call to exit. It's a call to figure out how to fix it. Needs and problems of the church. And look at that. Those needs and problems, they exceeded the gifting and capable... Uh, the abilities, that's all I was looking for, the abilities of the apostles. Isn't that interesting? That was on purpose. God intentionally does that. He creates groups of people, churches, disciple environments, where the leadership cannot possibly meet every need. And nor should they be expected to. They're supposed to be doing what they're called to. And then the rest of the body is supposed to be doing what they're called to. And that's a really healthy environment. And then what the apostles do? They instructed the disciples... So they didn't just sit back, right? They gave some instruction how to be active and fruitful. Say, hey guys, like, take advantage of this. Let's figure this thing out together. I know we got to do this. You guys are there. How about we just get some people that are full of the Spirit, full of wisdom. I'll let you decide that. You don't need our supernatural wisdom to help you figure that out. You guys are part of the family too. So you guys can figure that out. Prioritization. Another big word. I respect very much those 12 that said, hey, you know what? Like, that's not supposed to be our gig. We're not supposed to be meddling in that. We're not supposed to be controlling who gets chosen for that and who does that. We're supposed to be committed to, like, the ministry of the word and prayer. That's what we're supposed to be. That's where God has us. Not that that's not important. It's obviously important. But thankfully, they were mature enough to realize and humble enough to realize that's not their gig. Isn't that nice and refreshing? It's refreshing to be around leadership and to be around bosses and to be around parents and to be around authority figures where they don't think everything is their job and they need to micromanage it. Well, then it will never get done. And if it gets done, it gets done the wrong way. And then if I don't do this, I don't do that. You gotta let that stuff, let it blow up in your face. There's value in that. God will help bring together the pieces. He's really good at that. So I love the prioritization, which led to a supernatural increase of believers, which it did. 
because it increased more people. And look, we read for the first time that priests started to become an active part of the believers. It's pretty interesting. So that's just a plain meaning. That's like zero interpretation. That's just literally what happened. So now let me just give you what I think. These are quick ones, okay? Spirit-directed word. First one is, which I shared about already, is that the need slash problems purposefully exceeded the calling slash abilities of church leaders. The need slash problems purposefully exceeded the calling and abilities of church leaders. That's one observation you just got to pick up, which I think God wants us to just pay attention to. It's very normal to be in an environment or to be in a family or to be in a season of life where you purposefully are presented in that situation and you don't have everything that you need. That's normal practice of the Holy Spirit. To be in situation, like whoever said, uh, God won't give you more than you can handle. I, you know? <laughs> come on. I was reading about that the other day. <laughs> <laughs> like, come on. Really? If you've like read this for a period of time and you see the immense amount of situations where men and women, faithful men and women of God, were placed in situations that were far beyond what they are capable of, it's ridiculous. It's everywhere. That's how God demonstrates that He's God. That's how He gets us to finally believe with Him. Not just in like intellectual agreement, but it actually we see it made manifest. Like, wow, He's actually able to do it. He's able to do it if I just entrust myself with the little bit that I have, or with the lot of bit that I have, if I entrust it to him, he's going to be able to do it. I am grateful that he places us in churches and in life and in families and in situations to where we can't figure it all, all out and make it all happen. But it's a necessary part. It helps grow our faith and understand. And honestly, all those problems, they present opportunities. And unfortunately for a lot of us, and I'm not saying in this room, I'm just, you know, just talking Christians in general, for a lot of us who just see them as problems and something we just want to fix and just get over with and just be done with. And you can think of like things, things you just want to be done. I just don't, I don't want to deal with it. How can I just get it done? I don't want to deal with it. And the reality is, much of what E preached about a few weeks ago, it's about a process. It's really true. There's a process like that God is just calling, to, calling for us to go through and experience so that we can understand and experience what He's like. So He's building an actual history with us of how faithful He is and how He does come, how he does come through. And if we just want to skip it and fix it and just like get away with it and just be away from all the problems, that's not even close to God's heart. That's actually very fleshly. And you want to know what it is? It's actually supremely rooted in fear. Because we're afraid to be in that environment to where we know it's going to stretch us and we know it's going to stress us out. And we know it's going to be like, man, it's going to suck. And I don't see this happening, like ending anywhere good. And many times the Spirit will exactly lead us right to those opportunities. He's going to say, listen, partner with me and watch me breathe life into it. And our response is, well, how long will that take? <laughs> what exactly do I need to do? And the Spirit's just trying to get us to a place where He's just said, listen, just release, just totally release, totally surrender. Give all of yourself to me the best way that you know how. I promise you. I will come through and be faithful. So problems and issues within a church, like it's not a reason really to leave a church unless it's really significant. And that's a small list, by the way. But they're going to be in every place. And those are opportunities. Those are opportunities for us to grow in and build towards unity. And it's just crazy to me. We see that in the first church with the original 12. You know, there's discrimination in the first church. It's like, what are these guys doing? They're just humans. You know, we have problems. So here's the second observation. Number two is, greater ministry and more significant influence is released to those who are full of the Spirit and wisdom. 
greater ministry, more significant influence is released to those who are full of the Spirit and wisdom. I mean, that's just a theological truth that you can take to the bank. And the reality is, every Christian has some element of spirit and wisdom. Every Christian does. If you're a born-again Christian, and if someone is a born-again Christian, they have the Spirit of God in them, and they have some element of wisdom. The difference is, some people have chosen to live a life of partnership and surrender, where they are full, not maxed out like they can't take anymore, but they carry a certain maturity and a certain fullness in their life where it's very obvious that the Spirit, that's what they're about. Obedience to the Lord, man, their heart is there. Wanting to go the same direction, the same way that God is, man, that's where their heart's at. Those are people full of the Spirit. And full of wisdom? Sure, every Christian has some of that. But there are some people that excel in that. And so we're talking about, you know, full of the Spirit for a minute. I believe what that means is, when you're talking about the life of the Spirit, you're talking about gifts and you're talking about fruits. Gifts and fruits. And when you look in the Bible, you can see the fruits of the Spirit. And in Galatians 5, right, it lists all of them. Gentleness, love, self-control, peace, you know, all these things that are there. And so to be entrusted with more influence and greater ministry opportunities, well, certainly, like, we want to grow in that. And then there's gifts. All kinds of different gifts within the Spirit that the Spirit will use. And it's interesting that Timothy was one of them, and he was known for the supernatural, just signs and wonders. And he would pray for people, and things would happen. And he would speak things, and things would happen. Very interesting. And now when we talk about wisdom, it's not just like, some people think wisdom is, well, just the older you get, you know, the more experience you get, and the more wisdom you have. That's partially true, but that's not the wisdom that God's talking about. There's something deeper, more revelatory to that. Because godly wisdom, young people can possess. Older people can possess as well. There's a certain depth, certainly when you're older. But it doesn't just fall and rise there with just with age. That's, fleshly, that's very fleshly and carnal. Also, it goes beyond, you know, some people just make pros and cons lists. What's the pro, what's the con? That's not exactly a huge level of wisdom there. You have some analytical skills, and you have some ability to analyze the situation and list some things. But at the heart of wisdom, it's a little bit deeper than that as well. So it's more than lists. It's more than age. I think basically what wisdom is about is being able to possess an ability, a sensitivity is really what it is, a sensitivity to God's spirit in important moments. Those are wise people. But they're just like, you know what? I could go this way, I could go that way. There's not really necessarily a black and white here. But I can just tell. This is where the Spirit's going, and that's where I want to go. That's a very wise and discerning person. Because then that means they're not looking for the end outcome to decide whether they made a mistake or not in the beginning. So for example, you make a decision to do something. <laughs> I'll tell you what, I'll talk about the church plan because that's easy to talk about. So when Julie and I were at our core group, right, family helped out, other people helped out. We had more people setting up on that Sunday. It was like 12 people setting up. I think there was four people there. And not much change in like three years. So if you look at the end, the result, the immediate result, and you just judge it just based on what's happening. It's like people aren't coming. And that's not even the only thing. People aren't coming. Like there's like, there's no like, Nothing alive about it. There's no, I don't even think God even cares. You know, it's just, it just seems very dead and dull. You might as well just join with every other church that is dead, dull, and dying. That's the way it feels. So, you take a step. You go by that. Someone could just look at it and say, hey, listen, yep, that's our sign. God is telling us. This is obvious. You know, we shouldn't be doing this. I don't think wisdom operates just based upon, like, whatever the outcome is. Wisdom operates based out of 
what has God showed me? What has he spoke to my heart? Because I can't be confused, because then let's say, hey, let's say it all flipped and turned, and you know, hundreds of people showed up the first time, and things were jamming, stuff was just alive and amazing, and that could be deceptive as well. Is God really in it? Or are we just really good at creating an environment that got people jazzed up? And tell you what, you can't judge just based upon whatever the, the two results were. You can't judge if you did something right or wrong in your life just solely, just based on the results there. Now, of course, you can do stupid things and shoot yourself in the foot and make bad choices. Yes, you can. <laughs> don't don't like, act like that doesn't happen. And that could play a part in where you end up with certain things. But at the end of the day, like, wise people, they're able not to get caught up in that because then their emotions are going to go up and down, they're going to go sideways, they're going to be doing, they're going to be all over the place. But a person with wisdom, they realize, like, man, if I attach myself to the results and to the situations and to the circumstances, I'm going to be a mess. But if I tie myself to Jesus and stay close to his heart, and since I was there in the beginning, even though this happened, I can't explain it. All I know is that God was with me in the first place. And I was surrendered then, and I know what I heard then. Does that make sense? So wisdom, I'm not saying don't make any pro-con list. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying don't get older or like hate getting older. I'm not saying that either. You should learn from your mistakes. Like Stop making the same mistakes over and over again. But at the same time, God's wisdom involves sensitivity. It involves sensitivity. And not everybody carries that. And they're saying, hey, give us seven guys. You know? Full of the Spirit. Full of wisdom. Last observation. Special selections in the church are needed for growth and for health. This is one a lot of people don't like. Well, why did they get chosen and not me? I'm amazed, actually, that that's not in here somewhere. I'm amazed that we didn't read somewhere in here that as soon as special selections happened in the church, that there was not a split, a riff, something. I'm actually, like, amazed. And maybe it happened. They just didn't put it in. <laughs> but it's just, that's crazy to me. But that's a necessary part of church growth. And church health is that moments in time there are just selections. And now the main issue is a lot of times in churches selections are made just like in jobs or other situations people get chosen and they're not really the best candidates. That's what creates a difficult environment, right? How did so-and-so get that job promotion and I do their work all the time? It's not a fair situation. And that's really frustrating when it happens in the church. It's like, really? So-and-so has been now specially chosen to do this or to do that, but they're still doing this in their life and I know about it? That doesn't make sense. And so again, even like if that situ situation were to come up, I don't think this, the, the answer is, oh, there's problems, there's issues here, they don't really believe in Jesus. Da, 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 da. You, go direct, you do the hard thing, and you start the conversation and say, hey, this seems inconsistent to me. And you try and like, start that conversation the right way, with the right people. But special selections, they got to happen in church. They got to happen. It's a necessary part. And some people are going to feel out, and obviously some people are going to feel in. But the reality is, hopefully, hopefully we're doing all that we can to build wisdom and sensitivity to like what the Lord is doing. And uh, sometimes some wrong people get in, the, get in the wrong place. Even with the best of intentions. And hopefully church leadership and church environments are just humble about that. You know what I mean? So here's the bottom line. If somebody were to wake you up at 3 a.m. in the morning... Tonight, what was church about? What did you talk about? There's no way you're remembering all that. So I give you one line. So that's on this slide here. So this 3 a.m. wake up one liner is this. He'll find it for us. Everybody, right? God's kingdom. 
Does he have it? You find Josh? It's like the third or fourth slide. I put it in the wrong order. All right, this is the 3 a.m. wake up. God's plan to build his kingdom is to significantly use every believer. 3 a.m., you get woken up. I mean, that's the deal. That's what we're talking about this morning. That's God's plan. That's God's plan. That's his ultimate game plan to build his kingdom is every single person all hands on deck. And that presents challenges and issues because we all, we're all different places. We don't feel confident about a lot of things. But that's the game plan. That's what God wants to do. And there's a way to sort of fight for it and make it happen. I, uh, let me see here. I got a couple questions at the end just to think about that. Two reflection questions. And then we're done. Um, I think it's the last slide, Josh. Which character most accurately describes your current season? I just wanted you to think about that for a minute. Now you don't know what I'm talking about. As we read here, you had some different characters, right? You had the leadership, church leadership. You had the disciples, just the church environment, right? You had the widows, right? People that were getting discriminated against, but they really needed stuff, right? Important time of life. Um, and then you had the deacons, right, that were chosen. And what that does, that paints a picture of people can be in different seasons. And so it's hard to contribute to the body when you're the widow and you're in a season of life where it's just you just really need some heavy-duty mentoring, uh, pouring out, and investing into. With food, with time, with energy, with all that stuff. And the reality is that's always, if it's a healthy church, that's always going to be there. And some people are just in that season. But everybody say the word season. It's only supposed to last for a season. We're not, we're not supposed to be like a, a social group that just helps them stay there forever. We're supposed to be a place where we start to bring in God's truth, His love, His power, and equip them to where they can now own life and then move on and start to minister in their own way. Right? Or some people here, right, like myself, or I don't know, or Keith, he disappeared too, or, or Rob, right? It's more like church leadership. To where we got to think about some of this stuff, it's like, well, <laughs> sometimes it's scary to just say, hey, you guys just kind of like figure that out. Hey, just pick seven guys to do it. Or hey, just try this thing over there. It's kind of scary when you feel like you've been in prayer and like sought the Lord's heart and you've really gone after some things and God is saying, yep, I know and I appreciate that. Now just let them work that thing out. It's like, God, but I can really, really help, you know? It's like, no, don't touch it. Leave it alone. It's not what I'm doing. You've got to be able to do that as leadership. And you also have to be able to instruct, you know? Sometimes the temptation is just to be passive and just wait back. And so there's like a certain sensitivity of like when to press on and when to lay back. Or you might relate more to the character like the deacons, where it's just they've been faithful in life, they've been doing well with the Lord, and so now they're entering a season to where the Lord is actually promoting them with more ministry and greater influence. And so I don't know which one like, you might relate to more, but it's something to think about because at every stage, there's an opportunity, there's a way to help contribute towards bodybuilding. Even if you've got nothing and things are difficult and life is just hurting bad, there's a way to contribute some way, shape, or form. You don't have to have stuff. As long as we got Jesus, there's a way to contribute. And so in the second question is really one to think about. How proud is Jesus of your current bodybuilding? Because that's the main issue. Eventually, you know, we're going to be before him. How proud is Jesus of the way that we have helped towards building up or not helped towards building up his body? Have we been more critical just watching? Or have you really been like in the trenches and been being apart? You know, are we known for doing what we can to draw people together and build in unity? Or known for kind of just looking for issues, or, you know, ha having personal problems and just never really actually being a peacemaker, but just bringing issues? That's an important question. How proud is Jesus? And, and i got to think of our church family. How, part, how proud is Jesus of our church family? Like, how well are we doing as far as 
building up the body as a whole with the big C. I mean, we're not perfect. You know what I mean? Someone's going to say, oh, you could always do better. Yeah, I know. I know. That's such a cop-out. It's ridiculous. You, yes, you could always do better. But the reality is to look honestly at it, given your situation, your context, and what you have and what you're around. How responsible are we really being? Would Jesus be proud and say, you know what? My son and daughter there, they get it. They're contributing to my work. And there's been times that it's been tough for them, but at the end of the day, they're doing it. They're contributing to my work. Church and the things that I have, it's not about them, it's about me, and it's very obvious in their life. And there's a lot of that in our church, which is great. But again, we're not perfect, and so we have some of the other stuff too. And so I think that this passage and these verses do a tremendous job as far as just having us take a step back and just look at the church, leadership, how it grows, how it gets built up, and how God multiplies out of that. And it's nothing that anyone can like point to you and tell you and uh, sort of create a blueprint for how you can body build the kingdom of heaven and give you all these steps. It doesn't come from that. It just comes from being intimate and in relationship with the Lord. That's where it comes from. Because there's some stuff you can do and there's some stuff you can't do. There's, actually, there's very few things that you can do. There's a lot of things that you can't do. So that key word of priority, prior, I, that I can't say, priorities. I'm having a hard time talking. Priorities, that's a key word. Just handling your life and saying, what are my priorities? Where is God calling me to invest in? Where is it? Stuff like we talked about, right? The non-negotiables. You got to know what your non-negotiables are in your life and in your schedule. I don't know what they are and I don't want to tell you what they are. You want the Lord to say, what are the non-negotiables in your day? Say you get you however many hours of sleep. What are your non-negotiables? You have to do. You know that they're of highest priority. Some people never ever think about that. They just, whatever comes into my life, whatever seems to be the most urgent, I just address it. Oh, you're letting all the circumstances of life dictate what your priority should be. Don't do that. It's robbing you. It's robbing you. You're probably feeling it. Don't do that. Let the Lord dictate. Like, it's your life. Own it. And God has given it to you for a purpose to build towards his body and build towards his work and what he's doing. The great thief of awesome things are good things. It's a thief. So we have to be able to be a people of God to say, hey, these are non-negotiables in my life. This is what I need to, however, whatever the time is, non-negotiables. Then there's other things that are like, you know what, they're pretty important. I've got to do these things. Then there's some that are like, you know what, it'd be nice to do that. I want to explore it more. I want to think about it, pray through it, research it. Right, but there has to be some kind of way like, where we categorize and look at these things and bring them to the Lord in prayer so that way you can feel like you're living a balanced, fulfilled, God-honoring life where everything else isn't eaten all your time and all your lunch. I mean, we're all busy. We all got tons of stuff to do. But there is a way to fight for the non-negotiables, the most important things of life. Instead of being held hostage by everything else and the urgency of the moment. And I know that the Spirit of God wants His people to grow in that. He wants us to grow in that. And to be able to recognize, you know what? Yeah, I probably should go work out today, but that's not this day planned out this way. And there's a non-negotiable that I haven't done, and i got to do it. Oh man, it would be so much fun to go to this thing. Ah, oh, but I gave my word that I'd go to that thing. I gotta go. Like we gotta be able to have that and be men and women of God who can do really well at that. 